liberty lovers, and welcome to the Liberty Mike podcast, broadcasting from an undisclosed location in the heart of Dixie. I am Michael, and I am here with Liberty Larry. How's it going? Doing okay. How are you? Pretty good. Yeah? Yeah. Good. Um, is this Manhattan better or worse than last week's? I think it's right on par. I think you got some consistency going on. Well, that's too bad, because we used a different whiskey. We did use a different whiskey. It I think this is a better whiskey. Yeah. I had one of these last night with the other whiskey, so let me let me take a sip of mine. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, give it a try see what you think. I mean, it's good. I really like it. Hmm. I think uh I think Rittenhouse makes a superior Manhattan to High West. Okay. Um it's been a week since each of them, so I don't know. But yeah. I but I like this a lot. Like it's really good. Um, but I did get to clear that nice looking bottle from the high west <laughs> oh, yeah. whiskey uh, and so. I mean Rittenhouse is one of my favorite. That's one of my go tos. Yeah. So. I truthfully drinking Rittenhouse, I'd almost rather just be drinking Rittenhouse. Yeah, yeah. Like not even bother mixing it's, that. It's, it's a good sip in uh, whiskey. Yeah. Um but uh, you know, had to had to make some choices. Yeah, yeah. and that one was in the cabinet right above where I was working when we <laughs> when I was mixing the whiskey. I didn't have to walk across the room for that, that one. That was the most available bottle. <laughs> yeah, it was, the, it was closest in in terms of reach. There you go. Yeah. Um. So where you know, what do you want to start with tonight? Oh, you want want to start with gun violence? No, not really. <laughs> All right. Um. Actually, okay. So. Uh, my mom gave me some criticism on the last podcast about not having statistics about abortions. Yeah. And um, she said that uh, the last she'd heard that it was something like 15 million abortions performed in the U S yeah. and I may have misunderstood her because I thought she meant yearly. And I was like, wow, that's, that's ins- well, I mean, when you, so you told me that the other day, and I wasn't surprised. I was like, yeah, that yeah. sounds about right. I mean, a lot of people in this country, I, I, I was way yeah, off. Yeah, but that's like, <laughs> like 5% of the population. Yeah. Yeah. There's 300, <laughs> there's over 300 million, but, you know, yeah. roughly 300 million people in this country. 15 million abortions a year would be 5% of the population being cold every year. Well, as big of a deal as we make out of the subject... Mm-hmm. I mean, I figured, yeah, there must be a lot. Like that's, that's the reason we're complaining so hard, right? Yeah. Well, um, okay. So I I did look it up. Yeah. And uh, it turns out um, that the number is a lot smaller than that. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. Uh, so in the, like the last full year that I could that I found like good um, numbers for uh, was 2019, and there were 630 thousand roughly um, 630 thousand legal abortions performed and reported in the U.S. So I guess the number could be a little higher than that, but probably not by yeah. a lot. Well, I mean, those are pre-COVID numbers. You don't think the abortion rate changed after COVID? Well, I don't know. I, I know that the uh, um, people being locked in their house resulted in a, a in a bunch of extra pregnancies. Yeah? You don't think any of them got <laughs> aborted? I'm, I'm sure that some of them did. I don't know if the rates were any higher. Though. I don't know. Um, it, Just something to think about. Now the so the number though, and and actually it's remained pretty steady for a long time. A long time. time. Yeah. yeah. Um. So I think probably like if it was you know fifteen plus million that that number is more likely like the number of total abortions that have been performed in the U.S. since Roe v. Wade or something like that. Yeah. Um. Because if you take six hundred thirty thousand, multiply it by forty nine, um, because it was nineteen seventy three, yeah. um. You come up with about thirty, uh, about thirty million. Oh yeah. Um. So, I think that that's that's yeah probably more likely where that number came from. Yeah. Um. Now a number that I was kind of surprised at though is that uh and this has remained fairly steady for a while too is that there are about twenty abortions for every hundred live births. That's interesting. Um. So like. You know, excluding, um, I suppose, miscarriages. Yeah, I guess excluding miscarriages, um, roughly 15% of uh, pregnancies end in abortion, which which (laughs) does seem like a big number. Yeah, that does seem like a lot. So Um, I wonder if that number 
Uh, the number of abortions, though, includes miscarriages because when you have a miscarriage... Oh, if you're far enough along, then... Yeah, the procedure they have afterwards is still considered an abortion. Yeah, that's a that's a good question. I I don't know. Yeah. Because they didn't... You'd, you'd have to refine it down again. Yeah. Um, the My statistical source was not including descriptions. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> but thankfully, I think. Yeah. Um, so I, I don't know. Yeah. I don't know, but, um, but that's only, yeah, that's only for uh later term miscarriages though, isn't it? I, I would assume, but, but I don't know. Um, I don't know. Yeah. I don't either. Um, but I, I have been, I have been thinking about this abortion issue, um, quite a bit and cause to me, it, like, okay, what they keep referring to is the 14th amendment, which is, um, the equal protections amendment. Uh, yeah. and this is the amendment that came out after like it immediately follows the 13th amendment that frees all slaves. Right. Okay. Um, or yeah. abolishes slavery in the U S that was a good um, one. Yeah, that was definitely. <laughs> and, uh, the 14th amendment, the purpose of it, um, was to ensure that the slaves were treated as like all other citizens of the, or the former slaves, the freed slaves were treated as citizens, just like every other, um, citizen of the U S. Yeah. And so that's where the um, it, it essentially reiterates the the Fifth Amendment um, protections stuff um, in light of including it, uh, in, including the freed slaves. So it's saying that you can't um, that, you know, people born here and so forth are citizens and that all of these citizens um, retain the same rights and privileges and are due the same protection um, protections and so forth as any other citizen. Yeah. But they've like the courts have twisted this to, um, to include all, more. yeah, yeah. Include all kinds of other things. So they, they use this, um, in all the, uh, discrimination stuff, uh, in terms of, um, that, um, Okay. They, they're they using the equal treatment under the law or that the law applies to everyone phrasing to may to try and make an, a case for equality yeah. in the, the political sense that we see it now, where it means that um, everybody should get the same things. <laughs> yeah. Right. <laughs> right. Um, and like free health care and stuff like that. Well, I, Yes, I suppose. I mean, that I think that that's actually like one of the one of the directions that they have gone with it um, is to say, well, if if anybody has health care, then everybody should have health care because it's equal protection. Yeah. Um, and uh, so we should provide health care to the people that can't provide it for themselves and so forth. I, it, it has been used as a vehicle to create rights that don't exist. And I I understand like there's a. So the Ninth Amendment, which is generally ignored, like the other thing yeah. that we talk about this mostly is the Tenth Amendment, of course, that says if it's um, if it's not a power expressly delegated to the federal government, then it is uh, a power that remains with the states and the people. Yeah. But the other, um, and I think the framers were trying in this case to make sure that the um, the Constitution wasn't looked to as a limiting um, document. Um, they, in the ninth amendment, they said, uh, just because a right isn't expressly written here doesn't mean it doesn't exist. Yeah. Okay. Right. Um, so, uh, you know, essentially they said we can't enumerate all rights that people have in this document. So yeah. just because it's not listed here doesn't mean that it's not a right. Yeah. Um, now that of course can be misused too, but it, the Ninth Amendment is never really referred to, and the Constitution has become kind of a limiting document that where they're they're arguing that from the other side and saying, well, um, if a right hasn't been listed in the Constitution, it must not be a right. Yeah. And of course, there's just a real general confusion about what rights really are. Okay. Um, so there's a Liberty Mike classic out there from summer a couple of years ago uh, that we had originally recorded when we didn't have a real platform, <laughs> yeah. I guess you would say, um, that we re-released on this platform. Um, 
which I, I recommend people go listen to. Um, it's not real long. It was, I think it was less than 30 minutes. Yeah. Um, but it's a, it's a good explanation of our position on what rights are. And so, you know, going back, to, for example, to um, health care rights, we would say that that's not a right at all because it is the, um, I guess, like you're only looking at, um, we only believe negative rights are rights. Yeah. That's, that's More mine rights, and yeah. Liberty Larry's position and uh, most libertarians, I would say. Yeah. Um, most good libertarians. Yeah. Although <laughs> I was thinking, I heard somebody talk, attribute some belief to most libertarians recently. And I was like, I don't know that that's fair, yeah. <laughs> but, um, I think this one is generally, gen- generally fair. Yeah. Um, but maybe not. There, there is that whole school left libertarianism that. Um, yeah, but those guys aren't really libertarians. Well, yeah. In my maybe book, that, maybe <laughs> that's it. Maybe it's just a, a matter of definitions. Yeah. But um, so the negative rights are things that essentially they're um, prohibitions on what others can do to you. Yeah. Um, and the the rights that are enshrined in the Constitution are all of this type. Yeah. Um, and I've had people give me pushback on the, um, right uh, to an attorney. Yeah. The right to an attorney. Yeah. Um, that, oh, okay, well this is, uh, um, requires You're... somebody else to do something for you. Yeah. And, and actually, but, but that's not how it's stated in the constitution. In the constitution, the right to an attorney is that the, the state can't prevent you from having counsel. Yeah. It doesn't guarantee you counsel. It just guarantees you, you well, if you can secure counsel, you can have it. They and, can't prevent you from taking counsel. And my retort to that is, too, is the state's the one that's bringing action against you. So if, if the state's going to be, state meaning the government, is going to bring action against you, then they should at least in, on some level provide for you to have a defense. Um, because, you know, I mean, that, that to me that just seems fair, mm-hmm. you know. Especially when you're bringing action against people who may not have the means. Yeah. Well, but they aren't required to. Yeah. I mean, the the Miranda rights is something that's added on later. And yeah. Well, and I, it's something I stand by, though. Like, it's mm-hmm. some, I do believe in that. Like, I think that you should have a, not, more, more than just a right to counsel. Like, well, I guess you should have a right to counsel. That's what I mean. Yeah. Um, because you, you have the right, but you don't have a guarantee. Yeah. Now, uh, the Miranda rights guarantees you counsel. Yeah. Um, so it'll be provided for you if you can't secure I just, it. On it's too own. easy for people to get railroaded mm-hmm. if there's no like fallback as far as that goes. Yeah. But you don't need that from the state. Um, I, yeah. I, the, the free market, will, like people will yeah, step the, in. The yeah. truth is that um, if somebody needs an attorney and deserves one, <laughs> yeah, yeah. they'll get one, yeah. um, whether they can pay or not. I agree with that for the most part. So, um, and you know, th- this doesn't actually conscript anybody. Uh, the the attorneys themselves, um, they're well, they're showing up voluntarily and they're being paid by the state. Yeah. Um, you know, I mean, so it's not it's not by force per se. No. But I mean, I guess you can make the same argument for healthcare. Yeah, but again, it, w- it wouldn't work that way, like in practice. But like that could be an argument for like free health care for everybody, you know? Yeah, that you're not you're not forcing these people to do it, and they're still being paid when they choose to. Mm-hmm. So I don't know that my argument's as strong as I think it is. <laughs> well, I, what I would say is that I I don't um I, I guess I don't take the premise, uh, which yeah. is that the um that the state providing you with an attorney is a right. Yeah. yeah. I, I, I just don't agree with that as a premise. Yeah. Um, I agree that it's fair. Yeah. I like, I, <laughs> I agree that, um, that I, I like the practice of making attorneys available to people who can't, Afford um, them, yeah. but I don't see it as a right. I and, gotcha. um, and so, you know, with the, all right, let's try and take this from another direction too. So I was talking to somebody recently about the um, Libertarian Convention next week in Reno. Yeah. And uh, I will be there, so look me up if you're there. Um, I don't know how you'll do that. <laughs> you can email me and we can hey, we can meet up. Yeah. Uh, I give my email address on every single one of these podcasts. So yeah. um, Michael at the Liberty Mike dot com. 
So um, I, I'm pretty sure that it is in Reno because prostitution is legal there. Yeah. Prostitution is not a right. <laughs> <laughs> oh, come on. That was the whole... <laughs> no, no, okay. Um, <laughs> sorry. That was yeah. totally unnecessary. <laughs> so uh, I, I was saying that um, to this person that uh, I thought that it was there because prostitution is legal because this is one of those libertarian positions that, that um, is promoted uh, quite a bit by the libertarian party. Yeah. Which essentially comes down to people's rights to associate um, and that uh, voluntary transactions between adults shouldn't be regulated. Yeah. Which I agree with. Yeah. Um, and uh, she was saying, you know, well, that can go in some bad directions too. Like, what about um, uh, human trafficking? Yeah. And I said, well, but it doesn't apply there because one party involved in this transaction, at least, yeah. is not consenting. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> you know? Like, the person buying and the person selling may be consenting, but the person being bought or sold, uh, bought yeah. and sold, um, is probably not. Yeah. People and, aren't cargo, mate. And, and it does lead, I mean, this argument does lead down into weird pathways of like, can you sell yourself into slavery and that kind of thing. But I, and yeah. I don't want to, I mean, that's just like a way deeper and far more nuanced discussion. And I don't yeah. want to get into that here, but on the, on the basic level, yeah. um, the, the two parties engaged in business are not the only parties to this deal. The person who's being exchanged is also a party to the deal, and they are not yeah. consenting. They would have to consent. Yeah. yeah. Um, and so it's the the argument that they're making about abortion, or, or well, actually, it's not even really about abortion. It's about um, uh, um, repealing. That's not the right word, is it? Um, overturning. There we go. Overturning Roe v. Wade mm -hmm. um, and Casey versus Planned Parenthood. Uh, the argument that is being made on the national level that this will lead to all kinds, if this right, which I don't think is a right to begin with, though, yeah. and I'll explain why again in a moment. Yeah. Um, if this right is not, uh, guaranteed, um, then there's a whole, and is sent down to the States, then there's a whole bunch of other rights that aren't stated in the constitution that can now be challenged by the states. And mm -hmm. one of the things that they bring up all the time is, um, well, you know, then states could start making um, uh, interracial marriages illegal again, yeah. like they had been in the past yeah. um, in some places. Now, um, I don't see these as being the same thing because, uh, and, and as it applies to the 14th Amendment, which is the, uh, you know, equal protections, um, and contract law is a part of equal protections, and all a marriage really is is a contract. Yeah. Um, and in the case of a marriage, presumably, at least in the U.S., um, both parties are consenting. Yeah. It, it's, again, a contract between cons two consenting adults, whereas an abortion, there, well, and of course part of it depends on whether you believe that one party is a human or not. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but... Certainly an argument can be made that there's a party to this agreement that isn't consenting <laughs> to having its life taken away. Yeah. Um, and then, you know, the next thing as well, even as a baby, it doesn't consent. But um, you're looking for positive consent, right? Yeah. In this case, not the, the lack of, uh, of a, um, dissent, but an actual, like, <laughs> positive consent. Yeah. Um, and, and you'd need to be old enough to consent. Well, but in that case, so here's where that's the problem, though, yeah. is that um, for children, their parents are the consenting party in agreements that ah, children engage in. Didn't consider that. Right. Okay, fair enough. Yeah. And so, I mean, I guess you could make the argument then yeah. um, that... Uh, Essentially, that the abortion is an agreement where the parent is taking the, um, is giving the consent on behalf of the, yeah, fetus. Yeah, but you couldn't give that same consent if the child was born. That would be murder. Right. So, just saying. Yeah, I. So it runs into problems. I yeah. Mean, like there, there's yeah. obviously problems, but um, the, you know, the point that I'm trying to make is that the um. 
the argument that the 14th Amendment um, either gives or revokes this right is dangerous from the start. Yeah. Um, and that it is n- it, it doesn't um, reflect on other things such as um, interracial marriages and so forth because the situation is different in those cases yeah. where the 14th Amendment, I think, does apply in terms of equal protection um, and uh, consistency of how the law is applied, including contract law. Yeah. And um, there was some other point, but I lost it somewhere in the middle there. <laughs> Well, that's what was great. it? I don't know. Don't look at me. I don't have it. It's not in my pocket. <laughs> Can't remember what I said three minutes ago anyway. It had something to do with something I said three minutes ago, I'm sure. Yeah. Um, but uh, yeah, I think that mostly this should come down to Ninth and Tenth Amendment stuff. Um, and then the question is, uh, it comes back to where it always comes back to with abortion, which is when is it an independent life? Yeah, yeah. And, um, conception. Well, then you're murdering if you take the plan B pill. Yeah. I, I don't I mean, ne- there I are people that are making that <laughs> argument, but yeah. I, but I don't, not necess- a lot. I don't, like, I don't necessarily that's a very prescribe radical, to that. Yeah. yeah. That's a very radical position too. Yeah. Um, I, most Americans fall somewhere in the middle. Yeah. Um, and if you start giving, it seems that if you start giving like developmental milestones, of a fetus that most people fall within the first trimester, some kind of limitation within the first trimester. Yeah. Which is what Roe v. Wade actually, um, was fought about like kind of guaranteed. Yeah. Um, is that the States couldn't place restrictions in the first trimester. Yeah. I, I think as I understand it. Yeah. So, um, it, it is a really complicated subject. Um, and, and which is why I think it should be taken away from government. Yeah. At the um, end, end of the day, yeah, that's... You know. the- but in, in this particular case, because it's such a, a contentious subject and because um, because the good faith arguments can be made on both sides and because there's no like generally accepted definition of when life begins um, and the, the, the two extremes of this, which are the only two points that seem to me not to be arbitrary, which are conception and birth, yeah. um, are not the positions where most Americans fall into, you know, thinking that abortion should be allowed or disallowed at these points. Yeah. Um, then I think that the best answer that you can, that you can give is that, Hey, maybe, maybe nine justices at the federal level shouldn't be able to define it for all 50 states and 330 million Americans. Yeah. That Maybe the, we should let smaller sections decide. Right. And, and good news, by the way, on that, this mm-hmm. section is broke into smaller, this state, this country is broke into smaller sections. Yeah. They're called states <laughs> and they can, they can govern themselves. And they were supposed to be pretty independent. I mean, the constitution yeah. was really supposed to be formalizing just a, uh, defensive and economic alliance. Yeah. Yeah. And if we had stuck to that, we would be so much more prosperous. Yeah. <laughs> well, um, if we had stuck to that, we would probably be two separate countries, at least at this point. Yeah, probably. Um, because the, the real shift in the, the ideology about that happened, um, with the Civil War. Well, that, yeah, that, that, that concept was lost when the South lost the Civil War. Yeah. Uh, essentially. Mm-hmm. Um, and I, I think it just, uh, I just think it goes to show that power flows upwards. Yeah. That, um, that people who oversee a larger, um, uh, a larger what? I, I don't want to talk about this in terms of geography. Um, or population, actually, for that matter. But uh, whoever has the largest segment to oversee tends to uh, accumulate power, I guess. Yeah, yeah. And so, so power tends to to flow upwards to the top. Um, and the Constitution was supposed to limit that, but it, it failed miserably. Yeah. Which is in, the reason regard. I'm not a constitutionalist anymore. <laughs> yeah. Um, and, uh, you know, there's... There's no guarantee. Like I, I'm an anarchist, but I recognize it's a it's a um, idealistic position. Yeah. You know, um, I, I recognize that that uh, that you know you you don't you won't end up with a 
anarchistic utopia yeah. uh, any more than you end up with a communist utopia. Well, um, both would take a, a major culture shift, which is which is what the reason I think that people talking about these things and podcasts mm-hmm. like this one and stuff mm-hmm. of that nature is important yeah. is to try to to at least shift that culture some, mm-hmm. you know, I mean, you'll never have a full wave like what we would want. Yeah. But if you can even small victories, mm-hmm. you know, even if you got that full wave, you would never get a hundred percent. No, never. Uh, of yeah. People, which means that there will always be problems. Yeah. Um, I think that there are fewer problems and, and, you know, one of the, with, uh, anarchism than, you know, a more extreme government. Yeah. Um, and I, I think that one of the places where you actually um, end up in a much better position is morally. Yeah. Um, allowing people to make their own choices is just better than taking those choices away. Well, and and letting parts of the country make decisions for those parts of the country. The mm-hmm. localization we talk about, where yeah. like your local government's the most powerful. Mm-hmm. Like that, that lets people kind of vote with their feet. And if they don't like what's going on in their neighborhood, yeah, you move. But you, even at that point, like you have a lot fewer, um, uh, like, uh, relationships that are involuntary, yeah. but you still have involuntary relationships. And yeah. of course in our ideal world, there wouldn't be any involuntary relationships. Yeah. Um, but I, I realize that that's a pipe dream too. But th- the point about that I, I kind of wanted to make about that is because, um, because you can't end up with a perfect world doesn't mean you shouldn't strive for one. Absolutely. Right. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, and I, I would love to have people all on my side on all of these issues, but, um, you know, one of our friends, um, who I've, uh, debated m- on several occasions about th- what the structure of government should be, yeah. um, one of the things that it's always come back to when I'm talking with him is the the difference in the results for the individual in the sense that if I get my way, and this is, you know, this is something that you said too when I talked about, you know, I had people say, well, you and I don't have the same politics and your response was, oh, I have the same politics as everybody because you can do what you want as long as you don't impose it on me. Exactly. Um, and and this is what it's always come back down to in my debates with him is like the difference between your position and my position besides the like obvious ideological framework um, is that if I get my way, you can still do your thing. Yeah, exactly. But if you get your way, I can't do mine. Exactly. And that's the why reason our way is the best. Right. <laughs> that's the reason we win. Is that in the end it comes down to each their own as long as they don't impose it on everybody else. Exactly. Um, and and that's the argument here for why uh, abortion should go down to the states. Yeah. Is that, you know, we don't agree, so why is it that you get to impose on me what your position is. And yeah. the thing that amazes me is that the left isn't satisfied with that. Like the the places where the left is in control, they'll still have abortion. They can have abortion right up to the moment of birth, even after. Even <laughs> in Virginia, like that. Just, <laughs> yeah. I mean, but in context, that was like yeah, um, abortions that didn't that, that the baby survived. Yeah, which is <laughs> even even worse to think yeah. about. By the way, <laughs> yeah, um, but. Uh, yeah, in in this framework, in the the new framework, um, the places where the left is in control, they'll still have their abortions, but that's not enough. That's not good enough. Yeah, yeah. I don't know. We didn't talk about it on the podcast, but um, when this came up, but uh, Amazon is talking about allowing um, if this court ruling does go the way it looks like it's going to go, that they'll um pay for people to travel, employees, pay for employees to travel to get an abortion, mm-hmm. um, which I just thought was... Part a, of your health insurance premium? I, I, guess. I guess so, but that just seems like, that just seems wildly inappropriate to me. Um, and I guess because I see where the logical next step is to that. And to me, okay, well, if you're going to pay for them to go have it done, then you're only like another step removed from like paying an incentive to have them go do it, yeah. you know? Oh, oh, you're pregnant. Go get an abortion so you can come back to work sooner. Yeah. <laughs> like, I mean, it just... There's a nice bonus in it for you? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I'm I'm just saying. I mean, I'm not saying that's That what certainly starts happen. pushing some ethical lines at the very yeah. least. Yeah. yeah, exactly. I I thought so when I heard it, but you know, like I say, I don't yeah. know. <laughs> um, 
Well, speaking of murder. <laughs> oh, yeah. Now we won't go directly on into This is a hard transition good, into good, good, good segue here. Yeah. Um, so there were several shootings. There was. Uh, in the last week. There's like one in California and one somewhere in the northern Midwest and one somewhere in the central south, I want to say, or southwest maybe. Anyway, um, but the only one that's getting talked about yeah. is the one in Buffalo. Yep. I was going to say that's the one I've heard the most about. So, um, why do you think that is? Well, they're, uh, they're definitely trying to push an agenda with this one. Mm -hmm. Um, and that's been my take. Um, the, the big thing, so I haven't heard like a ton about this, but I have heard some. Um, and the, the big thing I heard that they were talking about on court TV actually was that, um, that this is like a blatant, um, this was in a recess for the Amber Heard trial. <laughs> Pretty much. This was this was a little break in between. You know, they, they give you all the like cases that are going on and keep you updated on everything. Mm -hmm. So small breaks though, because yeah. <laughs> Amber Heard's like the thing. <laughs> um but yeah, um talking about ah, oh, what is it? The oh, I just talked about it earlier. What? I don't know. Um Oh crap, uh, it's completely gone. I don't know where you're going. <laughs> um Well they were um the laws that regulate, um, ah, like gun laws? No, not gun laws. Um, crap, it's completely gone. Terrorism? No, it's not the terrorism one, but I that's know, we close. We definitely need to talk about the yeah. domestic terrorism. Well, we're going to talk aspect. about that too. But this was, um, ah, oh, where if you hate crimes, hate crimes. That's what it was. God, why can I not think of that? Uh, yeah, because um, it's stupid. It, because it is stupid. And the whole time I'm watching them cover it, because they're talking that this is a prime example of you know. Um, of hate crimes, like mm -hmm. like this is this meets the definition or whatever. Okay. And do you know why they say that? Why do they say that? Because every well, because every crime should meet the definition, right? Because <laughs> why if if you don't hate them, then you wouldn't be murdering them. <laughs> yeah. Like that's my that's my take on that, and that's my problem because they were talking about more stiffer penalties because because that this was a legal channel so they were mm -hmm. going real deep into the legal aspects of it talking about you know um well there'll be more stiff stiffer penalties and and this that and the other i'm like man like shouldn't the most stiffest penalties we have be for murder period well i mean that's a that's actually a different debate um so my father was in law enforcement for 30 something years right yeah okay uh and we talked about this one time and he's he was telling me that the vast majority of murders are like a one time thing crime of passion yeah they're they're generally they're often crimes of passion that yeah. it, that person would never would never do again. that again yeah um and uh the the he he felt that the crimes that should get the um the strongest penalties were the ones that people repeat yeah um, and that included like a lot of like armed robbery, like it was other violent crimes, but yeah. it was, um, it was not generally murders. It was, uh, armed robberies and, and, um, you know, carjackings like and that. things like yeah. this. Theft. Yeah. Yeah. Violent theft. Like yeah. burglary. Well, no, no, I guess, uh, muggings and things like that. As yeah. Assault and robbery. That yeah. kind of stuff. Um, and because the, the, uh, the vast majority of murders were committed by people that, if they weren't in that specific situation, would never have done that. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. Um, I don't know. I don't know. That was just, again, I like hate, I haven't done a bunch of research on this or anything. I know yeah. that the recidivism rates on things like uh, um, robberies and assaults and so forth is, is certainly higher. Yeah. But it may just be that the murderers are all in jail. <laughs> yeah. I mean, maybe yeah. I don't know. I mean, and I mean that robbers get out in a couple of years and just do it again. I definitely see the argument as far as you know, people that that in other situations would likely never murder anybody again. Mm -hmm. um, and showing, I'm not saying I hate to use the word leniency, but more leniency towards that than somebody that's like yeah. shot up a mall or something. Yeah. Well, I think that the law is is supposed to be subjective. Yeah. Well, yeah. Um. But so, you, you kind of kill that with all the states that have the mandatory minimums and stuff like that. Yeah, well, you know, at some point you'll just plug all the information into a computer and it'll tell you what to do. Yeah. So. <laughs> well, we're heading down that road. Mm. But no, I have, a big, I have a big problem with the hate crime thing. I mean... I, I do too, because it's, it's a thought crime. Yeah. Um, in a sense, what you're, you're, you're punishing somebody for the motivations to their crime 
rather than the crime itself. Yeah. And, um, and even with admissions, like it's hard to, it's hard to say with certainty what the motivations for the crime are. Yeah. Well, this guy so, wrote apparently a 180 page manifesto. Yes. That's, <laughs> so, so, that's what so, I've heard. So too. If, if you want to sit down and get the motivations from him, what he did, I, it's I, all out there. Apparently. I mean, I wonder if it's a, how available it is because they've worked so hard to remove all these things from, yeah. from availability. I, don't have, I mean, I don't have time I to personally read. don't want to read the ramblings of a crazy person. <laughs> yeah. Well, and that's um, because this guy was like, he had been certified at least at one point. Yeah. Right? He'd been, he'd been committed at one point, yeah, I think. Um, yeah. I mean, it, he could have committed himself. I don't know, but don't yeah, know he, either, yeah, he did. Um, he did spend time, um, in a psychiatric ward and, uh, you know, there are things like the FBI had looked into him because of something, or he'd gotten a psychological evaluation because of something that he wrote in high school. Um, the problem here, and then of course now, in retrospect, uh, people say, oh, well, you know, the law enforcement should have done something about him then. Um, we could have prevented this whole thing, but you can't, I mean... Well, Man. I mean, people like, still you have the right. See some of the stuff that I wrote when I was in high school. Yeah, people still <laughs> have the right to say what they want and what they believe. Yeah, I mean, we're. I mean, well, even if you show violent tendencies or or you write something violent or whatever, that doesn't. It, it, yeah. plenty, it's not a predictor about whether you're actually going to do something or yeah, not. Plenty of people do stuff like that and never act on those. Yeah, and I would say the vast majority don't act on it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly right. So, um, so you can't punish everybody that's doing stuff like that because a couple of some them people just bad. need an outlet. Like some, mm -hmm. for some people writing stuff like that is their outlet to make sure that they don't do it. Yeah. He should have played basketball. Yeah. Right. <laughs> you needed I, to get, get that outlet out that way. Yeah. <laughs> that can be a violent sport. Have you ever played? I have. <laughs> Not um, with you though. Like, no. <laughs> you just watch those elbows. Man. Yeah. I hear you. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, so I, I think like, I haven't been able to piece all this together and I'll be honest, I haven't been following it real closely because, uh, especially like soon after these things, there's like a lot of, information well, there's just a lot isn't. of bad information. Yeah. yeah. Um, but as I understand it, he like pointedly went to a black neighborhood is one of the reasons that they're, they're talking about this. Yeah. Um, but at the same time they're talking about, he talks in the manifesto about, um, uh, um, the, the replacement theory, you know, this idea that white people are being replaced in this country. Yeah. B but those two things don't, don't jive exactly. Yeah. Um, because the, the replacement theory is about immigration. Yeah. yeah. Not, not about <laughs> blacks already living here. I, I don't know. I, <laughs> Maybe he missed that part. Well, yeah, Maybe I mean, it could be that he just doesn't understand. Who knows? Yeah. Um, it's it's hard to say. But uh, I, I also, as my understanding is that the first person he shot was a white person. It was, yeah. Um, <laughs> so I don't know how this fits in. This is, I did some research on, um, on you know, backgrounds of uh, people that commit mass shootings in the U.S. Yeah. Uh, and... Broadly speaking, this is what I found. Um, political ideology usually plays a very small part. Yeah. Um, even if political ideology plays a part, yeah. uh, it plays a small part. Um, that uh, mostly it's about personal problems um, yeah. and psychiatric problems. Um, and it's probably a good thing that people keep bringing up mental health as an, as an issue in this because it seems to be far more of a factor. Yeah. Well, I was going to say, at least the little bit I've looked into, I mean, that seems mm -hmm. to be the biggest factor there yeah. is. Like, like well, sane people don't tend to do this. It, well, exactly. <laughs> um, and then uh, when you break it down by race, uh, the mass shootings are committed. How do I? This is a hard thing to articulate. Um, the racial makeup of mass shooters mostly matches the racial makeup of the country. Oh yeah. 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 Okay. So, um, you know, whatever percentage of the population, white, blacks, Hispanics, et cetera, are, uh, that's roughly the makeup of mass shooters as well. 
Interesting. I didn't know that. Yeah. Um, so it doesn't really generally seem to be a racial thing okay. either. Uh, now, in this particular case, and over the, because uh, we covered this in, it, I think it was at the end of 2020 that this stuff, I, I pulled this out from my old notebook. Ah, yes. Um, <laughs> old notes. Yeah. Uh, that the Department of Homeland Security, um, and the Justice Department were pushing this idea of domestic violent extremists uh, um, as being the new big threat to the U.S. And we talked about it at the time as the way that they're pushing the terror war inward. Yeah. Um, and that's, the I, I think, the main reason this one is getting all that press Yeah. Um, is because they're making the case that this is a, a, a terrorist act. Um, and I'm not even saying necessarily that it's not, but... Yeah. Um, that they're yeah. pushing this this terrorism thing um, partly to uh, validate their funding. Yeah. And um, to continue to push this uh, this idea that we need to turn internally on people in the United States that have issues with the government or the way government's doing things, which is mostly what this is about. Um, and it, it names you know this uh, this document that came out. Um, I think it was at the end of 2020, but it might have been the beginning of 2021. Um, they talk about different types of extremists, and um, the common thread in them is it, that it is somebody who is challenging the political or economic order. Yeah. And, so us. <laughs> well, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, I, I think that that's broadly true. I did find it interesting when I when I got this out today though, that one of the specific types of violent extremists that they mention is abortion related violent extremists. Mm. Um, I think they were talking about right wing yeah. <laughs> at the time, but you know, I, I think that can probably arrow can be pointed the other way pretty soon here. Yeah. It might be maybe even now. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, uh, but I think that's really what it's all about. And then we were listening to, um, oh gosh, I forget his position. Uh, we were listening to a clip of that guy. It was too long to play on the podcast. It was like three minutes or something. I, and I, there wasn't, wasn't a good way to break it and up. And it wasn't particular. I mean, it wasn't that one interesting. It just wasn't. It was boring. It, yeah. That, that's <laughs> the was, word I'm looking yeah. for. It was boring. <laughs> I, <laughs> there's people out there listening. They're like, God, you guys play boring stuff all the time. Um, well, we don't think so. <laughs> <laughs> but he, he was talking about how, um, the, that the government doesn't have the capability of coming through all the social media and finding um, the the kind of content that both leads to this and the content that he was actually producing, um, and uh, and uh, that of course we don't want the government looking at everybody's communications all the time, which I uh, certainly agree with. Yeah. Um, I think that they are. Yeah. Uh, I mean, they're not looking at them all the time. They're they have them though. They, yeah, they're they have access recording to them. them. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, they're archiving them, I guess you'd say, uh, at least according to Snowden. Yeah. Um, I think he's generally believable on this point. Yeah. But um, that that the the situation needs to change, and that the social media companies need to do more um, to uh, root this stuff out. Yeah. And so, of course, what he's really advocating for is that the private companies do the things that the government is prohibited from doing um, in the name of everybody's safety. Yeah. <laughs> That's what we want, right? Yeah. <laughs> hey, man, safety and security over freedom, right? Yeah, All right. So, um, anyway, uh, the... That's what this is all about, I, I think, especially since it was live streamed and there's all this Discord chat that they have and so on and so on and so on. This is um, they're they're trying to focus this back towards social media so that they can uh, get the control there. Yeah. Yeah. Regulate it or um, yeah. monitor it or whatever. Yeah. And not El let Elon Musk take over Twitter. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and and what you have to see the, in this trend is that this this is the activity of authoritarian governments. Um, that there are fewer and fewer places that people can just say what they want to say without the government watching them. Yeah. Um, that the government is becoming, you know, the real big brother that you're supposed to be scared of. That yeah. you should be scared. That you of. should be. Yeah. Um, and the arguments that, well, I'm not doing anything wrong, that at some point they just don't hold anymore. Yeah. 
Um, and you, you know, one of the things that, um, that social psychology, uh, has told us is that people act differently when they are being watched. Yeah. Period. Yeah. Like if you're being watched all the time. Yeah. Think of some of the stupid stuff that you do alone in your home. Yeah. I mean, you know, between dancing around or singing off key or whatever that you like, if you knew you were being watched, you wouldn't do. Yeah. And people and people need that type of release for one. Yeah. But even more than that, anytime you you start restricting speech, you just push it down, which makes it more violent. Mm -hmm. Like if people don't think that they have a way to to air their grievances, Mm -hmm. then that just makes them tend to be more violent. Yeah, that's true. Because they're going to air them out one way or the other. Mm -hmm. Well, and, you know, the question about whether this guy should have been able to get a gun or what have you, um, the assumption there is that if he hadn't been able to get the gun in the way that he did, that he just wouldn't have done any of this. That just doesn't seem to jive with my knowledge of human nature. Right. Um, I think that once you've decided to kill people... Yeah, it's you're gonna coming. find a way to kill people. Yeah, and there's there's always a way. He'd have made a pipe bomb or something. Who knows? Yeah, but um, but just keeping preventing him from accessing a gun, I don't think would have prevent it would have prevented this specific event, but it wouldn't have prevented an event from this guy that yeah. resulted in deaths. Absolutely. Um. Well, and the the relation that that the gun is the problem just doesn't jive because we live down here in the South and there are guns everywhere. Yeah. I'm talking everywhere. Well, I mean, as I understand it, he said in his manifesto that he chose a place that had restrictive gun laws because he knew that he wouldn't have anybody shooting back at him. Exactly. And that's exactly the point I was trying to make is Mm -hmm. like we have guns down here everywhere. And I'm not saying mass shootings don't happen down here, but they don't happen down here like they do in other places. Mm -hmm. And and when they do, they're stifled pretty quick. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. It's hard to go anywhere down here and not. Yeah, you're going to encounter somebody with the gun. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) And it's not usually law enforcement. It's like the the guy at the 7-Eleven, you know. (laughs) Um, And to go back to the... uh, surveillance and individualism thing. I, this is a point that I, I, it probably seems like a small thing, but this is something I like to stress a lot is that the, the other thing that surveillance does is it, um, it reduces individualism. It like enforces conformity. Yeah. That's probably a way I should say it. Um, it enforces conformity and this isn't positive in the long run. Um, the in, individualism is the kind of creativity that leads to to big advances and changes and and improvements and progress in society. And the more you enforce conformity, the less of those kinds of developments you end up with because you don't have divergent thinkers and you need divergent thinkers. Oh, absolutely. Um, I mean, look at the, the technological advances uh, between the, um, the Soviet union and the United States. Yeah. Um, the, the United States advanced technologically far more quickly than the Soviet union did. Yeah. Um, and the populations weren't that much different and the, you know, the levels of intelligence and so forth. And the, the Soviet government pumped a bunch of money into R and D. Yeah. Um, but just that, that enforced conformity, I think probably limited the possibilities of breakthroughs on their side. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I don't have, I guess like empirical evidence for this, but, but it, it, it seems follows. to be the case. Yeah. 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 Um, well, we, wow. Uh, we've been talking a long time. You know what? Um, I'm, Did let's we just have... skip the last thing that we were going to talk about. We can hit it next time. I don't think it's going to change. I do just like a quick update, um, on the Russia, Ukraine conflict, uh, which is still going on. I was fixing to say, so it's still going on. Yeah. Um, but, and I, I would say, you know, based on, the reports that I'm reading, the Russians are still inevitably going to win this. Yeah. Um, no matter how much money and so forth we pump into it. No matter how much of our counterfeited money we send over there. Right. (laughs) Um, but, uh, some developments that I think are important, um, is that the, um, so general, um, Mark Milley, who's the, uh, 
Oh gosh, what's his title at the Pentagon? Ooh, I don't know. Um, oh, I can't think of it. Anyway, um, top of the Pentagon. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, Lloyd Austin, who's the Secretary of Defense yeah. here in the U.S., they have both called um, their counterparts. They have initiated calls with their counterparts in Russia. Yeah. Um, and asked for by based on the reports, have asked for uh, ceasefires. Okay. Um, which <laughs> which actually shows a couple of things. One is that it seems that the Pentagon is more intent on bringing this conflict to a close than the State Department, since <laughs> Anthony Blinken still hasn't talked to uh, Sergei Lavrov, as far as I know, um, since all of this began. Yeah. Well, that's just insanity. Um, but uh, I, I do think that it's significant in a, in a couple of ways, is that we may actually finally be moving um, towards a, uh, at least part of the U.S. having a policy towards ending the conflict rather than inflaming it. Yeah. Um, and, that would uh, be a change. Yeah. And secondly, uh, the fact that, that our military guys have initiated calls with Russia um, asking for Russia to bring it into this conflict probably also reflects the situation on the ground better than the media does. Yeah. Um, by which I mean that they probably wouldn't be doing this if they thought that Ukraine had a chance of well, yeah, winning. <laughs> All right. <laughs> um, so anyway, I do think that it's important, and um, I did write uh, the letter. I don't know if anything ever got done with it. I. I sent I it to the Baldwin County Libertarian Party. Somebody said, well, maybe too late. I was like, are you keeping track of the news? Yeah. Anyway, um, oh, I, I said I was going to find a way to post it on what my on yeah, the we, Liberty Mike website. I haven't do done that. that. I'll, I'll have to talk to somebody about that, um, how to make a, a Word document downloadable without opening the site up to the potential attacks. Uh, uh, yeah. Um, but anyway. Russian uh, attacks. I... I I strongly encourage those of you out there to write your congressmen and senators and say, we want the U S to push towards a negotiated end of this conflict. Yeah. Which doesn't seem unreasonable by the way. No, it doesn't. <laughs> doesn't. Um, and, uh, Ukraine's probably going to have to get some stuff up. I, I would say at the very, very least, they're going to have to relinquish any claim to Crimea. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's... But probably quite a bit more at this point. Yeah. I think they could have gotten away with just that um, if they had Early been on. willing to negotiate at the beginning. Yeah. I don't think that that's true anymore. Yeah. So, um, but anyway, it is it is hopeful now, um, even though, and we'll, I guess we'll just talk about this more, oh, hell, when? I'm, we're not going to be here next week, right? Oh, I guess um, not. You're going to be in Reno. Yeah. Maybe I can get somebody there to talk with me about the Sweden and Finland stuff. I have a clip from the Swedish defense minister, like a little bit that I was going to play, but I, I won't now. Ah. So, um, because we're just not going to talk about it enough. Uh, but, uh, we are still inflaming things on, on the diplomatic side by, um, bringing t the talk of fast-tracking Sweden and Finland into NATO. Oh, I heard about that. Yeah. I forgot I had heard about that, yeah. Right. Um, but at least on the military side, it looks like uh, at least uh, the, the military portion of the U.S. government is starting to see the writing on the wall and yeah. um, is pushing for an end. Well, good. Yeah. So we'll take it where we can get it. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, and, uh, yeah, that'll be it for now, I suppose. And uh, we we won't be back next week. Yeah, we I, I, I may have I a podcast up. Um, yeah, I won't be back next week. Yeah, you're going to be out of town with the equipment. Am I going to take the equipment? I don't think I'm taking the. Oh gosh, that's a lot of extra stuff to take <laughs> on the plane. And you got to record it somehow if you're going to record up there. That's true. I may take just the recorder. I can get away with just the recorder. Probably it would be low quality, but I can I can fix it up and post. Oh, there you go. <laughs> Make it sound reasonable at least. Yeah. Um, Never sound as good as this. I don't know. That's true, but I don't I don't I, like I have a box that I can pack up these microphones and so forth, but I have limited stuff that I can take on the plane. Yeah. Without you, spending a whole and, bunch of extra money. And do you trust your plane to get it there? No, I do <laughs> not. I have had horrible horrible luck with uh, baggage generally. Um, and I definitely don't want them to lose like a thousand dollars worth of equipment. 
So. <laughs> so. So we may or may not have a podcast up next week. Okay. We'll see. Well, if not, we definitely got to at least do a small recap on Reno. Yeah, yeah. Um, we'll get that. But we'll be back. Um, we'll be back soon enough, as as soon as we can. Yeah. And um, yeah, we'll we'll get the Reno recap, and um, I may be able to get some content up between now and then. But we'll we'll just have to see. Um, I'll see how much room I have in my luggage once I've got everything packed that I need to. Yeah. It's a long trip. Yeah. Um. Like I'm out there a long way. Well, that, that too, but I meant I'm out there like five days or something, oh, yeah. five or six days. You're going to need a lot of clothes. Yeah, exactly. You better hope they don't lose your bags. I know. <laughs> You're going to be shopping in Reno. You know, on the bright side, I'm not traveling internationally. That's oh, when it yeah. always that's seems usually to happen. Been, seems the worst. <laughs> when yeah. I'm in another country and they speak a different language, that's when <laughs> yeah. they lose my luggage. I need a shirt. Um, Shirt. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like, Shirt. Yeah. At least you can like point what it is that you want. Yeah. Um, so, and then you can't figure out what the conversion rate is. And then they tell you how much something costs and you don't understand what they said. So you just give them the biggest bill that you've got. And, <laughs> and then they anyway. don't give you any money back. <laughs> yeah. It's all very confusing and terrible. Um, but, uh, well, you know, when we're back. Absolutely. Um, we'll, we'll finally get this right. You know, I've messed this up terribly. Yeah. <laughs> Do follow us on Facebook. Uh, you can subscribe on iTunes, Podbean, YouTube. Um, if you're going to be out in Reno next week, um, send me an email. Uh, Michael at the Liberty Mike. Uh, be happy to meet up. Yep. And um, what's all the other stuff? Oh, like and share and comment and uh, tell your friends and all those other things that help grow the podcast yeah help grow the podcast i was gonna say help promote us <laughs> <laughs> but your way is better i will yeah. remember that for the future um and uh we'll be back when we're back um and then we'll finally get this right so in the meantime try to stay free life short live free ciao later mm-hmm.